How's everybody doing? We will be in 1 Samuel chapter 18 today, and let me tell you, it is good to be back home. I, I hope you had uh, good services last week without me here physically. Uh, I actually heard both services online. Uh, it, it actually works out well because church at the United Church of Surf City fits pretty neatly into the time where we do Sunday school here. So last week I got to join first service over the internet, then I got to lead the people in the church at Surf City in a very different worship experience. We recited the Lord's Prayer and the Apostles' Creed, and no to all of you who were wondering about this, I did not point out to them this time the less than accurate usage of the word hell in the Apostles' Creed. If you don't understand that, ask me, I'll tell you later. Uh, Maybe next year I'll do that. I preached a sermon that was very similar to the one you heard here, except it was my voice saying it, not Paul's. We sang hymns to Mrs. J playing their beat-up organ as best as it could be played, and I think she got it rocking pretty good for them. Actually, I was telling Dr. J before the service that I think I got a little too into the hymn singing for the comfort of the people at the United Church of Surf City. We we sang Onward Christian Soldiers and A Mighty Fortress is Our God. Um, And some of them seemed a little uncomfortable by the volume that I was singing. (laughs) And and the fact, I don't know, that when you sing Onward Christian Soldiers, it's very difficult not to start marching. So I was moving around and I think that they were a little uncomfortable. But I think that if songs like that don't get you moving and belting it out, and like the songs we sing here the same way, I think there might be something wrong with you. Actually, uh, singing A Mighty Fortress is Our God was a last-minute audible on my part. Uh, we were actually going to close the service with a different hymn. Um, I like Mighty Fortress a lot, and I have set, jokingly said to Paul that we need to make up a, a rock and roll version of it to sing here. Um, it is one of the many, many songs, many great hymns of the church, quote-unquote, that are sung to the tune of drinking songs. But the real reason why I put it in the service down there, it did fit in the theme, so it was perfectly fine, but the real reason I included it is because they begin their service by singing a few songs by request, which is huge fun if you're the musician. And they'll sing a song, and they'll sing the first verse of three or so songs before they start their service. And almost every time I've been there, A Mighty Fortress is Our God is one of the songs that gets requested. But it is not a song that you can only sing the first verse to. Martin Luther wrote it, I think, on purpose, so that you have to sing all four verses to get the whole message. So I put it in the service so we'd get the whole message. And then after church was over there, I went back home and joined second service here over the internet. Then I drove home as fast as I possibly could to teach Sunday afternoon groups. And it is good to be home. And uh, I'm glad that all of you follow along in your Bibles when I preach, or on on the screen as I'm preaching, uh, because it is good for you to do, uh, and it's not something that every Christian does. So we're going to continue our journey through 1 Samuel chapter 18 today. In that place, it says, verse 1, After David had finished talking with Saul, Jonathan became one in spirit with David, and he loved him as himself. From that day, Saul kept David with him and did not let him return to his father's house. And Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as himself. Jonathan took off the robe he was wearing and gave it to David along with his tunic and even his sword and his bow and his belt. So after killing Goliath, David had a conversation with King Saul. And before, Saul didn't really know the young man who was in his service. Now he does. He succeeded where everyone else, including Saul, had thought he would fail. So Saul keeps David around. I mean, this makes sense. David is a very valuable resource. He is the giant killer. But something else very significant happens in those first few verses. It says, Jonathan became one in spirit with David and he loved him as himself. The Bible tells us that Jonathan and David became close friends. And in fact, Jonathan and David were actually a lot alike. They were close to the same age. They were both bold and brave. They were both men of action. 
And they both had great faith in God that came from a real relationship with him. Both Jonathan and David were godly men. So these two became good friends, but notice in those verses that this only happens after David had spoken to Saul. What happened there is Jonathan heard David's heart after God and his faith. And that is why they became such good friends, because they had a similar focus to their lives, relationship with God and trust in him. And Jonathan knew that they had this in common after hearing David speak. So he could trust David because David trusted God just like Jonathan did. Now, we ought to surround ourselves with people who love God more than anything else. Who what we have in common with them is that we will push each other toward greater devotion to God. That's what we ought to do. However, most often we surround ourselves with people who what we have in common with them is sin. We like to disobey God in the same way, so we hang out with them. Who pull us down and tell us what we want to hear. This is a big mistake. We often make that, but Jonathan knew better. After he heard David speak, he knew that this was another young man devoted to God more than anything else. And that was the important thing that he and David had in common, a love for God. That love and trust in God is what made those two able to have a friendship that was stronger than jealousy or ambition. And that's important because there was a major difference between Jonathan and David. David was the last-born son of a farmer. Jonathan was the first-born son of the king. He was the crown prince. Jonathan was the one who by birth should be the next king. But David was the one who was already anointed by God to be the next king. That should have driven a wedge between David and Jonathan because they were both on track for the same throne. However, Jonathan was not like his father. He trusted God. So the Bible says that Jonathan took off his robe and his armor and his sword and his bow and belt and gave it to David. By doing this, Jonathan was saying, God's hand is on you to be the next king. So the symbols of the crown prince that I'm wearing rightly belong to you. Jonathan lays aside his own ambition to honor God's choice. And do not miss this moment in the story. Because Jonathan is the person who by all human rights should be the next king. But he is faithful and surrendered enough to God to see God's hand on David. That David was God's choice for the next king. But that must have been difficult for Jonathan. Because God choosing David could be seen as God rejecting Jonathan. I mean, in reality, God was rejecting Saul and Jonathan was feeling the consequences of that rejection. But Jonathan trusted God anyway. He submitted to the will of God. And what we see here is Jonathan come through as a shining example of what it means to trust God and follow him no matter what. We all ought to strive to be like Jonathan. But also, don't miss David here. The agreement is one way. Jonathan relinquishes his claim to the throne, but David does not return that gesture. That's because David is the one who God has picked, who, has, who God has anointed king. 
But also, David does not say, good job, Johnny, I'm glad you see who's in charge here. Now I'm going to go take your dad off the throne and take what I should have. No, that's not what he does. In fact, read the rest of the story. It's going to be another 20 years before David is king. And David, throughout that whole time, is going to consistently refuse to seize the crown before God gives it to him. David will remain faithful in not lifting his hand against God's anointed, the king Saul. And David relies on God to move things. What we see here is that Jonathan showed his great trust in God by dying to his own rights and recognizing David as God's choice for king. And we see David showing his great trust for God by waiting for God to put him on the throne and trusting God's timing to do it. These two young men are shown to us by the Bible as examples of how we should live our lives trusting in the will of God. And they are united with each other by their love and devotion to God. The issue of who is Israel's next king could have made them hate each other. But because they both loved God more than the throne, they were able to settle the issue of next king and become great friends united by hearts devoted to God. We all could use such friends more than anything else. Now, before we move on, it must be said that there are many who try to place a homosexual relationship on David and Jonathan here. This is, and it will come back later on, this is ridiculous and inappropriate. There is no indication of such a relationship. And two men devoted to God enough to not be divided by complete, competing claims to the throne would also be men devoted enough to God to follow what his word says about sexual relationships. We should be offended by claims of a homosexual relationship between David and Jonathan because the people who make such claims suppose that it is impossible for two men to love each other without it being something that the Bible says is immoral. Sexual relationships between men in act or in desire are condemned by the Bible as wrong. But the Bible commands men to love each other. Our culture thinks that those two things are inseparable, that love and sex must always go together. This is a sin-corrupted view. And many men today feel that they cannot or should not care for other men in this way or, or else they're not real men. It makes them uncomfortable. And this fear of real love between godly men is what has crippled and emasculated the men we see in our culture today. Men should love each other deeply and David and Jonathan should be an example for us, particularly to the men, of real love between men. David and Jonathan are shining examples of how all of us should live our lives devoted to God. So the lesson for today, be like Jonathan and or slash be a David. And the Bible says that King Saul promoted David and gave him, gave him a high rank in the army. He sent him on missions, and whatever David did, God granted David success, so much so that all of the officers and all of the people were pleased. David is becoming a folk hero in Israel. All the people loved him because he had killed the giant, because he led the king's men successfully in everything that they did, and they loved him because they saw a man whose heart was after God's heart. And all of that should have been a good thing for King Saul. He should be happy that he had made a wise decision to put David in charge of so much. But like I've said to you before, one of the major points of 1 Samuel is to show us the contrast between faithfulness and unfaithfulness, to show us the difference between godly David 
an ungodly Saul. So it says, verse 6, When the men were returning home after David had killed the Philistine, the women came out from all the towns of Israel to meet King Saul with singing and dancing, with joyful songs, with tambourines and lutes. As they danced, they sang, Saul has slain his thousands and David his tens of thousands. Saul was very angry. This refrain galled him. They've credited David with tens of thousands, he thought, but me with only thousands. What more can he get but the kingdom? And from that time on, Saul kept a jealous eye on David. So, when the men got back, the women came out and started singing and dancing, praising David. And just so you know that when the women sing your praises, you is popular. And this was probably a new challenge for David. Because the sheep probably had never sang and danced to tell David that he did a good job as shepherd. So this type of fame and popularity could have gone to his head and made him full of himself. But once again, David is faithful to God. Maybe it's because David had grown up doing the right thing with no praise from anyone except God. And in this instance, we see no reaction to the songs of praise from David at all. There's no, let alone something that indicates that David has become puffed up by all this praise. Actually, look really close at those verses again. It says that the women came out to meet King Saul with singing and dancing, not David. In fact, there's no indication that David is even there to hear these songs of praise. The text says the women danced and sang, Saul has slain his thousands and David his tens of thousands, to Saul. They believe they're praising Saul. Of course they do. Saul was the one who put David in his place. So Saul shares in David's success in the eyes of the people. They're praising Saul. Not in Saul's eyes. And this shouldn't surprise us, because we've seen the character of Saul before. I mean, he did just send a teenager to die so he wouldn't have to. He's going to kill his own son for stopping his revenge. He hides in the luggage. He hides in his tent. He is not a godly man. Saul's going to Saul. He does not have a relationship with God. He doesn't trust God. So any little thing shakes him up and messes him up. So here, even though the intent of the people is to praise Saul, the mention of praise for David makes him very angry. It says that it galled him. He becomes intensely jealous of David. Now, you might think that it is a bad sign when a leader is threatened or resentful of the success of someone under their command. And you'd be right to think that. You might think that it is an indication of weakness on the part of the leader. And you'd be right to think that. You might even think that Saul is overreacting here. But there is something deeper at work here in Saul that is the source for his reaction. Saul remembers what Samuel the prophet had told him. Yahweh has rejected you as king over Israel. And those words rang in Saul's ears. They influenced the way he saw the world. It was Saul's own fault. His sin, his disobedience to God, is what led to God's rejection. And that probably made it worse. God was going to take away the throne. And it was all his own fault. Now, if Saul had been godly and honorable, he would have submitted to the will of God. Maybe he would have even stepped down as king because God had rejected him. But if Saul was godly and honorable, he wouldn't have gotten himself in this situation to begin with. So Saul, here in the story, is hanging on to the throne with every ounce of his being because he is constantly thinking, when will God rip the throne away from me? Who's going to be one, the one that God uses to tear this out of my hands? So when he hears the people mention David in the song of praise, when he sees that the people love David, when he sees that his own son loves David, 
when he sees how David is successful in everything that David does, Saul is threatened. I picture Saul here, much like Denethor from Lord of the Rings, saying, God thinks he's so wise. Yet for all of his subtleties, he has not wisdom. Are the eyes of Saul blind? With his left hand, he would use me as a shield against the Philistines, and with his right hand, seek to supplant me. I know who rides with Theoden of Rohan. Oh yes, words have reached my ears of this David, son of Jesse. I tell you now, I will not bow from this shepherd from Bethlehem, last of the house, long bereft of lordship. Rule of Israel is mine. I paraphrase that a little bit from the story. But that's what Paul is think, Saul is thinking. This little usurper is going to steal away from my throne. He's, God's going to use this little shepherd to take away what's mine. So he viewed everything David did with suspicion. We've already said that David is willing to wait and trust God. David is not moving to kick Saul off the throne. But that doesn't matter to Saul because everything is twisted by jealousy. So verse 10 says, The next day an evil spirit from God came forcefully upon Saul. And we've already talked about back when we dealt with this in chapter 16 that all spirits, even evil ones, are subject to the control of God and that he can use them if he wants. So the evil spirit comes to Saul again and the Bible says it came to him forcefully, powerfully. It says he was prophesying in his house. This does not mean that Saul is telling the future. The Hebrew word implies that Saul is acting hysterically. He, is, he has wild behavior, saying things that don't make sense. The king is beside himself. He is deeply distressed. The evil spirit is causing King Saul to act crazy. And because of this, David was playing the harp as he usually did. Now, would you like to see humility and devotion to the plan of God? It's right there. The one who killed Goliath. The one who was given a high rank in the army. The one who was successful in all the missions he led. The one who the people loved, the people praised, the people sang about. The one who the crown prince had relinquished his right to the throne to. The one who God had anointed to be the next king was still there. As usual, playing music to help the king in his spiritual distress. Are you that devoted to the plan and timing of God? Right here, David could have easily seized the throne. The people love him. The crown prince supports him. The king has gone nuts. But David trusted God and his timing. So David serves God faithfully right where God has him, and that's what he's determined to continue doing until God moves. Be a David. But there's more. Because it says, Saul had a spear in his hand, and he hurled it, saying to himself, I'll pin David to the wall, but David eluded him twice. Okay, so first off, first off, king, president, mom, dad, kid, uncle, whoever, if the person is acting crazy, if they are emotionally distressed, don't give them a weapon. Okay, general truth, a crazy person with a weapon will use it. But also notice the king's intention here. The king is trying to solve the problem of God taking the throne and giving it to David. Because he says to himself, I'll pin David to the wall. Saul is not trying to scare David or injure David. Saul wants to kill David. In order to pin him to the wall, the spear must go completely through David's body. But it says that David eluded him. The spear missed. Now, was, was Saul's aim bad? Did David roll a high dex check and dodge the spear? 
Did God supernaturally intervene and have the spear miss? It doesn't really matter which of those it is. David got out of the way, and the spear is there on the floor. What are you going to do if you're David? I know what most of you would do. Pick up the spear and pin the king to the wall. I just defeated Goliath. The people love me more than you. How dare you throw a spear at me? You could probably even call it self-defense. Get you before you get me. You want to play that way, Saul? Now it's on. You know, mess with the bull, get the horns. Don't stand on the tracks when the train's coming through. Whatever cliche you want to throw in here. Maybe you'd just say that you don't have to subject yourself to that kind of treatment and peace out, leave, be gone. Not David. David is a person who trusts God. Look close. It says David eluded him twice. Twice! That means that Saul threw the spear twice and missed twice. That means that after the first miss, David came back and played again. Now, we're way over the line for most people. I'll do what God says and play, play for the guy who doesn't like me. I'll dodge the spear. I'll even leave it on the ground and resist throwing it back. But one spear at my head is enough. One miss is enough. Once, once, once is submission to God. Twice is stupidity. I mean, it, it's like good old President W. told us that they had that saying in Texas. Fool me once, shame on you. You're not going to fool me again. I mean, come on. Does God really expect me to put myself in harm's way to follow him? Should I really have to suffer to do God's will? Well, ask the apostles about that. Ask David. You see, David's submission to God really begins when he sits back down and plays for Saul after the first spear. Now he knows the danger. Now he knows Saul's intentions. He knows what it means to wait on God and follow him. He knows what it costs. Now he really had to trust God. Are you that devoted to the plan and timing of God? Are you devoted enough to following God that you'll put yourself in harm's way to follow God and love others? Are you devoted enough to God to wait in whatever condition God has you until he moves? You see, in this story, David has the faithful position. David is saying, God, you put Saul on the throne. I know I'm anointed as the next king. You promised that. But getting Saul off the throne is your business, God, not mine. And I won't touch the Lord's anointed because he was put there by your authority, God, not mine. You started his reign, so you get to end it. Until then, I will wait and serve you no matter the cost. If David had abandoned that position and struck back, he still would have become king. And maybe the people still would have praised him for the restraint to not fight back after the first spear. But if he had struck back, David would not have become the king God wanted him to be. He would have lost something because he chose self-preservation over devotion to God. And the Bible says, verse 12, Saul was afraid of David because Yahweh was with David but had left Saul. And there it is. The reason Saul is threatened is because he recognizes that God has rejected him and left him but is with David. Verse 13, so he sent David away from him and gave him command over a thousand men and David led the troops in their campaigns. In everything he did, he had great success because Yahweh was with him. When Saul saw how he was successful, he was afraid of him 
But all Israel and Judah loved David because he led them in their campaigns. So Saul sends David away on military missions. And Saul is probably at least partially hoping that David will be killed in battle and the problem will be solved. But God was with David, and because David followed God, he had success in everything he did, and all the people loved him. Now, I really hope you are starting to see the lesson in the contrast between Saul and David. Saul is motivated by fear and distrust. And as some wise person said here a few weeks ago, the voice of fear is never the voice of God because there's no fear in love and God is love. So if you hear fear, it is not God. So don't listen to the voice of fear. And some of you have asked me, doesn't it say that we should fear God? That is a different usage of the word. That means to recognize who God is and who God ain't. And give God the proper respect that he's due. To recognize that all people will give an accounting to God of how they live their lives and that we should live our lives accordingly. Fear from self-preservation is never from God. That's where Saul lives. He lives there because he's not godly, because he doesn't trust God, because he doesn't have a real relationship with God. And lack of trust in God is where fear comes from. Fear makes Saul see himself as a victim. His life spirals out of control because he's cut himself off from God. Don't be Saul. Be a David. You see, it isn't easy to do the right thing when spears are thrown at you. It isn't easy to do the right thing when you're put out of the palace. It isn't easy to do the right thing when powerful people are your enemy. But in the midst of all of that, David did the right thing. He was devoted to God's timing so much that he didn't retaliate when attacked. He didn't seize the throne. He, he was faithful and trusted God so much that he put himself in harm's way to follow God. David was never a victim. We might say, looking at the situation, that David wasn't a victim. He was attacked. But David never had the mindset or acted like a victim. David is able to shine as an example for us, doing the right thing, remaining devoted to God through all of this for one reason and one reason alone. David knew that his fate was not in the hands of Saul. The one attacking him did not control things. David knew that his fate was in God's hands. And because David knew that, he was able to have peace in dangerous situations and to trust God to protect him. That's how David was able to be devoted to God. He trusted God completely. Be a David. If God is for us, who can be against us? Who can separate us from the love of Christ? Can trouble or hardship or persecution, famine, nakedness, danger, sword? We face death all day long. We're considered sheep to be slaughtered. In all these things, we are more than conquerors in him, through him who loved us. I am convinced that nothing, neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor demons, nor the present, nor the future, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Are you devoted enough to the plan of God to believe that and live your life like you believe that? Do you trust him that much? I mean, it's only been written down there for you for 2,000 years. <laughs> Don't be a Saul. Be a David. Have a heart like David. Would you like to see David's heart in the midst of all this? Psalm 27. Yahweh is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? Yahweh is the strong defense of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? The wicked advanced against me to, to devour me. It is my enemies and my foes who will stumble and fall. Though an army besiege me, my heart will not fear. Though war arise against me, 
Even then I will trust. One thing I ask from Yahweh, this only do I seek, that I may dwell in the house of Yahweh all the days of my life to gaze on the beauty of Yahweh and seek him in his temple. For in the day of trouble, he will keep me safe in his shelter. He will hide me in the secret place of his tent. He will lift me high on the rock. Then my head will be lifted up above the enemies who surround me. At his sacred tent, I will sacrifice with shouts of joy. I will sing and make music to Yahweh. Hear my voice when I call Yahweh. Be gracious to me and answer me. My heart says, seek his face. Your face, Yahweh, I will seek. Do not hide your face from me. Do not turn your slave away in anger. You have been my helper. Do not reject me or forsake me, God my Savior. Though my father and mother forsake me, Yahweh will receive me. Teach me your way, Yahweh. Lead me in a straight path because of my oppressors. Do not turn me over to the desire of my foes. For false witnesses rise against me, spouting malicious accusations. I remain confident of this. I will see the goodness of Yahweh in the land of the living. Wait for Yahweh. Be strong and let your heart take courage. Wait for Yahweh.